and me. Lord, that it be your spirit in every way. Because I love you, Lord. Because we love you. Because we want to hear from you, Jesus. So come. I was really wrestling last night. I was getting all quick and just Jeremiah was speaking. And I had all these different messages roaring through my head. And I kept saying, Lord, which one do I give? And the Lord finally said, all of them. Oh, God. Help me. So that's what we're going to try to do. <laughs> Ephesians 6.10. And the verses after that, that's the one. You all should know this one. It's the great warfare passage where it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, forces, of, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The picture there that's painted is of a very well-organized army. The Greek word arche is the word we translate principalities. And it means an overarching, demonic, ruling principality. Um, and it goes on to talk, really if you read the Greek, it goes on to talk about the, the, the well-organized ranks of demons beneath these commanders. And they're carrying out the schemes of the devil. The Greek word is schema. And it means a very well-laid plan. The function of a principality is to influence a culture. It's to cause an entire culture to think the way the principality thinks until that way of thinking comes to seem to the culture to be self-evident. And then those who stand against that way of thinking become the enemy. And they become the persecuted minority. They become a threat to the order. Yeah, a demonic principality, overarching, ruling demon that affects the thinking, and, 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 and after the thinking comes the behaving, the thinking of a culture, until that way of thinking comes to seem self-evidently right. And then those who don't agree with that way of thinking become the enemy. They become a threat to the order. This is where we are in America today. And I want to tell you that the ruling principality that rules over this culture is very literally, I'm not speaking figuratively, it's very literally the demon Baal. The same demon that seduced Israel and led them astray 2,000 years ago. There are four signs of the influence of Baal on a culture. I'm going to give them to you as soon as I put on my jacket because I live in Denver where it's supposed to be cold, and I'm always warm inside there, and I have to come to Florida to freeze. <laughs> I mean, you guys love your air conditioning. It's like, it's like too much, you know? So. <laughs> now I feel better. <laughs> Four signs. Four signs when the, when, the, when the demon Baal has become dominant in a culture. All four of them active in America today. And I'm just going to say up front that the, the real religion of America is no longer Christianity. It's recycled Baal worship in every way. We need to know what we're up against. So I'm going to give you a lot of bad news first. Then I'm going to give you the good news. First sign, consuming self-focus. Baal was a fertility cult, which meant it was a prosperity cult. A prosperity cult is focused on me, 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 me. What can I get? How can I succeed? How can I do for me? How can I make my flocks grow? How can I get more increase for myself? In America, how much money can I make? How can I make, how can I get blessed? All that kind of stuff. Fertility cult. You would offer sacrifices to Baal in order to get Baal to prosper your flocks in order to cause your crops to grow. So it's all about yourself. In America, we've taken that fertility cult and we've turned it into a cult of prosperity and we've twisted the doctrines of the church to fit it. Prosperity teaching has absolutely nothing to do with the cross of Jesus. Jesus did not die to make you prosperous. He died to make you holy. <laughs> we need to get that straight. And out of that prosperity thing comes, comes the entitlement mentality that infects the church. If I say the right things and do the right things and confess the right things and give the right amount of money, then God will bless me and God will make me prosperous. Well, that's not the deal. Jesus didn't promise us that. Now, he, he loves to see us prosper. Jesus loves to bless us with, with prosperity. What father wouldn't? 
but we've made it into a manipulation. It's almost a, it's almost a salvation by works again. If I confess the right thing and say, you know, push the right button, give the right amount of money, then God will bless me. God will make me prosper. But, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's gripped the culture. It's pervert, perverted the doctrines of the church. So we've made worship an entertainment event. Now worship is about me. I get, I get upset sometimes when I hear people saying, I got so much out of worship. I want to say, what did God get out of it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a sacrifice to God Amen. to put a fragrant aroma in His nostrils. But the influence of Baal has made it about us. That was Baal religion. Here's the second sign. Rampant sexual immorality flows right out of the first one. Sexual immorality is all about me, isn't it? It's about my pleasure. It has nothing to do with covenant. It has to do with exploiting someone else so I'll feel good. Sexual immorality. They had temple prostitution in Israel. It was tied to the self-focus. If you wanted your crops to grow, you went in and did a kind of a sympathetic magic. You had sex with the temple prostitute. They had homosexual temple prostitutes. So if you wanted your, 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 your cattle to multiply, you went and had sex in the temple. And they brought that into the temple of the Lord. And then that immorality spread to the whole of the culture until every form of perversion was accepted. And you hear the prophets in the Old Testament crying against this. We've, we've come to a place in America where Christians don't get it. Probably half of the weddings I've done in the last 10 years have been to couples already living together. And some of them already have children and bought a house. Because we don't get it. We don't understand. We're accepting things as normal that are an abomination to God. That's right. Now we have gay marriage. It's one of the certain signs of the influence of the Baal spirit on a culture. And I want to tell you that from the moment that homosexuality is accepted as normal, I'm not talking about hating gays. But the moment it's accepted as normal in a culture, you can count the days until that culture is done. Right. Third sign, the slaughter of the children. Baal Molech, I think, was the same demon. Molech was the same demon. I call him Baal Molech. The idol of Molech had arms outstretched like this. They would lay their children in the arms of Molech and burn them as a sacrifice in order to get Baal Molech to bless their crops and prosper them in business. We've sacrificed since 1973, we've sacrificed 50 million children on the altar of our self-focus through abortion. And if we haven't sacrificed them that way, we've left them home to raise themselves while both mom and dad ran off to make the double income that was necessary for the widescreen TV and the two cars. And now we're paying the price. My son's been in full-time youth ministry now for 18 years. And you ought to hear the stories that I hear. The kids are abandoned. They're alone. They don't know anything about anything. They're hurting. And that leads to the fourth sign of the influence of the Baal spirit, cutting and self-mutilation. How many of you remember what happened when Elijah confronted the 450 prophets, or 450 prophets of Baal? We were going to see whose God would call down fire from heaven. Remember that? 450 prophets of Baal danced around all day doing what? Cutting themselves until the blood gushed out. My son tells me that one in three teenagers is cutting today. And they don't tell their parents. They do it in places where the parents can't see. Psychologically, they do it in order to relieve the pain that they have, they, they, there's no other place to take it. Nobody's listening. Their parents don't listen. But in a spiritual sense, they're, you know, you, 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 you serve Baal in order to get power. They cut themselves in order to get power over the pain. Four signs of the influence of the Baal spirit on a culture. And I want to tell you what really concerns me right now. Whenever a culture has been gripped by a principality, until the thinking and the ways of that principality come to seem self-evidently right, and those who oppose it 
become the enemy, whenever that's happened, only, there's only been one remedy to break the power of it. And that's been catastrophic destruction of that nation or that culture. Examples. When Israel could not come away from idolatry, when they could not be broken of this devotion to Baal, God finally had to send a catastrophic destruction in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, tore the walls down, tore the temple down stone by stone, took the people off into exile for 70 years. And what happened was that exile finally, once and for all, broke devotion to Baal. They never, Israel never again, even today, never again went back to idolatry. But that's what it took to break the hold of the principality on the thinking of the people. Prior to 1865, this culture, our culture, America, was under the domination of a principality that caused the entire culture to think that black people were self, that it was self-evident that black people were inferior and that slavery was a normal and right thing. It took the bloodiest war this country has ever fought, a catastrophic destruction to begin to break the hold of that demonic way of thinking. Because we couldn't do it any other way. We couldn't get ourselves out of it. Germany, World War II. How did a nation of educated people come to believe that it was self-evident that Jews were untermenschen, subhuman? and that they were the cause of the world's problems, and that it was a service to the world to exterminate them. An entire culture. And the only way that that could be broken, finally, was for Germany to be utterly and completely crushed and destroyed in World War II. They lost an entire generation of young men. And it's so broken in Germany that it is illegal even to sing a Nazi song today. I'm afraid for America. But I believe we have time to pray yet. Because this is where we're headed if this isn't broken. At some point, at some point, a serious collapse is inevitable. Psalm 34, 7, you get real quiet on me really early today. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. This nation has always had the angel of the Lord encamping around us because we've been a God-fearing nation. No longer. We're at a point now where the angel of the Lord does not encamp around us. And so we're on the same level as all the other nations. At every other point in our history when we reached a crisis, God always managed to raise up some great man who could galvanize the nation to face the crisis and come through it. So in, well, in our, in our own Revolutionary War, we had George Washington. In the Civil War, we had Abraham Lincoln. World War II, we had Franklin D. Roosevelt, although I'm not a Democrat. <laughs> we had Franklin D. Roosevelt. Back in the 80s, we had a Ronald Reagan who could pull the country together. Now we're in the middle of a crisis, and we have no great men coming up through the ranks to save us and lead us out of this. No matter how this next election comes out, we have no great men waiting in the wings to lead us through this. That makes this the most important election in our lifetimes. Jeremiah and I were talking about you know, what's coming in 2016. What about these elections? When was to speak to that? I'm telling you, this is the most important election in our lifetimes. There are no great men to elect, but who we elect will determine whether the collapse comes quickly or whether we have more time. And we need more time because we're not ready. We are not ready. One of my books, Visions of the Coming Days, I wrote because I have a passion to prepare the body of Christ for what's coming. Our heart as a body of Christ isn't right. Our focus is off. Jeremiah talked about that. Our focus has been in the wrong place. And yet these days to come, listen, these days to come are the days for which you and I were born. I believe that an audience like this is the remnant. We're that groundswell that's, that's, that's hungering after a purity with the Lord that that doesn't want the hype, and doesn't want the hoopla, and doesn't want the, 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 the stuff and the methods, and the, we just want to be with Jesus. You know, this, this, is, this, is, this groundswell is the generation that says we want, 
We want a faith that's based again in the cross. The cross and the blood. We want to look like Jesus. We want to be him to the world. We want to live that selfless life. And we may be a remnant. We're probably going to be a remnant. But we're going to be an influential remnant. Mm -hmm. And there's going, to be a, there's going to be an anointing of the Spirit poured out on us that I believe will exceed the glory of Pentecost. Because that's what's required in this day. And God has been preparing us. God has been preparing a hidden generation. And I mean, he's been preparing us in hiddenness. He's been, how many of you felt held back? Right? Some of you felt hidden in the places where you've been deployed. And you've watched other people who have lesser gifting or lesser ability advanced beyond you in, in your places of work, in church, in the body of Christ. This is because God, God has been, God takes you to the wilderness to get you ready for a destiny. Amen. And so he's taken some of us into that place of, of frankly, suffering in order to shape our character so that when he pours this out, there's a foundation that it can rest upon. Jeremiah quoted me the other night, one of the things I say again and again is the glory sent to bless you is the glory that will destroy you if there's a crack in your character. And I go back to the story of the contrast between David and Saul. Saul never dealt with his issues. And I could, I could preach all night on that. He never dealt with his issues, his insecurity issues. And so when God sent the glory that was to bless him, he cracked and broke. And God had to take his posterity from him. And then comes David. David had a heart after God. You know what the difference between Saul and David was? David was a bigger sinner, wasn't he? Yeah. The difference between them is that Saul, could rip. Saul couldn't own his stuff. He always had an excuse, always some reason. But when David was confronted with his sin, all he had to say was, I've sinned against the Lord. What do I do? What do I do? See, we're a generation that just needs to say, you know what? I've sinned against the Lord. And there's no excuse. My heart is broken. One of the things I wrote, and yes, there's more, was I said, if you're going to be the friend of God, you're still a sinner. What do you do? What do you do if you fail? How, you know, if your friend fails you, if your friend breaks your lawnmower, how do you restore the broken trust? Well, you restore the broken trust with a broken heart. <coughs> the broken heart that God won't despise. Lord, I'm so sorry. How do I make restitution for this? Mm. How do I restore the broken relationship? So I, I could go on all night about that too. I believe that the, whole, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit yet to come is coming. I had three dreams. I'm kind of, to me, a lot of this feels like chasing rabbit trails tonight, but it all adds up to the same thing. Because the Lord said, don't leave out any of those messages that are running in your head. I had three dreams in the last, just in the last month. Hmm. The Lord doesn't usually speak to me in dreams. And so when I have a dream, I pay attention because I know that it's God. Hmm. And there was a thread running through these three dreams and I had to ponder it for weeks because I didn't get it. I said, Lord, I know there's something more in these. I keep trying to personalize these dreams and there's something more in it. I'm not getting it. And he finally explained it to me last night. These three dreams, they add up to the Father's heart. They end up to a, a, a mandate from God in three areas that I want to lay on you and I want to lay it on the body of Christ. First dream, John Paul Jackson came to me in this dream. And uh, the dream was so real and so vivid that I'm about 90% convinced that it was really John Paul Jackson that came to me in the dream that the Lord sent him. And he was sitting in a chair across from me, weeping, just in brokenhearted tears, grieving. And what he was grieved about was things on this earth, particularly in the prophetic, that he could not now change because he's not here. And he was pouring it out to me. And it was so real. It took me half a day just to shake it off. And as I look back at the dream now, I believe that this, there's a mandate from God for real plumb line prophetic ministry in the earth in these days that's focused on revealing Jesus, not serving the Baal agenda, 
bless me, bless me, bless me. Pastor, do you have a word for me? But real, cross-centered, reveal Jesus, plumb line, prophetic ministry. Along the lines of Jeremiah 1.10, to pluck up and to plant, to tear down, to build up. It's what Elijah did. It's the spirit and power of Elijah. What Elijah did was he called out Baal worship and he called the people back to a pure devotion to God. Hmm. That's the prophetic voice we need in these days. That's the prophetic voice that lovingly points out what's God and, call, and what's not and calls us back to a plumb line. Because if we don't do it, in 20 years, we won't have genuine Christianity in this country. Mm. It'll be over. And so God is calling forth, I, I believe it's a remnant right now, he's calling forth a chorus of prophetic voices that are calling us back to a plumb line. This is God, this is not. Calling us back to a simplicity of devotion to the Lord. Calling us out of the manipulation. Out of the entitlement mentality. Out of the what can I get out of it. And back to how can I bless God? How can I be God's friend? How can I walk the life of the cross? How can I take up my cross daily and follow him? How can I be a blessing to someone else? How can I lose my life so that I can find it? For the name, for, for the, for the name of Jesus. We're going to restore the... It's, it's, a, it's a prophetic voice that restores the church to her proper glory. Here's the second dream. And the second mandate to the church. Each one of these dreams involved a major leader. Second dream. I was preaching to a very small group of people in a room. And into the room came a pastor that I served under in the first, oh, 1991, 92. I was the executive pastor of a mega church in Denver. I'm not gonna say the name of the pastor because I don't wanna, I don't wanna reveal that. But I had been called there to be the executive pastor. And it turned out to be an incredibly abusive situation. There was dishonesty going on at all kinds of levels. That pastor was, he'd been in the heart of the renewal and he was turning away from everything repudiating the prophetic, repudiating signs and wonders, repudiating signs and wonders, just turning away from everything. People were feeling betrayed. People were feeling like they'd been let down. There was turmoil everywhere. I finally had to, I just had to resign. I had to leave. And I was, as a result, slandered all across the country by this man and badly, badly wounded. To this day, he will announce publicly from his pulpit, don't go to Lauren's church, it's a cult. And so I was really, really hurt there. But while I was there, I was challenged as a musician. And I, and I really grew as a musician because he had a bunch of prophetic musicians there. That were, I mean, just professional musicians there that were better than me. And they challenged me and I learned from them. And a lot of what I'm doing today, I'm doing because of what I learned there. And so he walks into this room and all of a sudden we're friends again. Because I hadn't spoken to him. He hadn't spoken to me in 23 years, 24 years. Suddenly we're friends again. I shook his hand and asked him how he was doing. We talked and there was a, a, a restoration going on. And so later on, I, I thought, Lord, is that really about him? No, it's not really about him. What it's really about is a mandate on the church. And the mandate is this. That man in the dream represented wounds delivered by leadership. Delivered by leadership that fails to understand the Father's heart. A lot of you in this room have been wounded by leadership that didn't understand the Father's heart. You've been wounded by pastors that didn't get what it was about to be a pastor. They didn't know how to be fathers in the faith. Am I talking to anybody today? Yes. I run into these people all the time. I don't go to church anymore because I got hurt, because leadership abused, because leader, you know, they just didn't understand. Every real father wants his children to do better than he did. You know, when Jesus said, the works that I do, he will do also because I go to the Father. Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father, isn't he? He's the perfect revel revelation of who the Father is. And so when he said that, he was expressing the true heart of a Father God. He said, I want you to do better than I did. So a real pastor 
imparts life into people such that they can do better than he did. So they can rise above him. He sets them free to grow. He's not threatened when they rise. He's not threatened when they do things that he can't do. He blesses that. He releases life into it. He encourages it. And we haven't had much of that in this culture. We've had CEOs for pastors. We've had controllers for pastors because they don't know how to be fathers. So there's a mandate on the church to heal the wound to the body of Christ and make the bride once more that bride without spot or wrinkle because Jesus isn't coming back for a bow wow. <laughs> He's coming back for a beautiful bride without spot or wrinkle. And this is what we need leadership that understands the Father's heart. This is, it's a mandate for the church and it's a passion of mine. Raise up leaders that understand what it is to be fathers. To set people free to grow. My third dream. <laughs> I need to preface this by saying that uh, I'm as angry as anybody else about what's happened in this country under this administration. I'd be hard pressed to think of almost any policy that's been enacted by this administration that I would agree with. I've seen what's happened and, I'm, and I, I hate it as much as anyone else. And so, but in this dream, President Obama was in town and he was in a, he was in a shopping mall someplace <coughs> to make an announcement about, uh, about the shootings, mass shootings. And every time he would try to make the announcement, he would break down with grief and could not finish. Just broken with grief. And they'd have to stop the filming and start again. So in this dream, I'm in the shopping mall. And the Lord suddenly fills my heart with this overwhelming, overpowering love for Barack Obama the man. And he said, I want you to go stand with him before the nation. And I kind of, in, in the natural, I would go, eh? <laughs> but in the dream, I was so full of love. It's like, what else can I do? And so I went to where they were filming, and there was only one Secret Service agent there. I walked right past him, walked up to the president, grasped his hand, and said, Mr. President, I've never agreed with any of your policies, but I'm here to support you. And he broke, and he wept. And he embraced me and connected. And yes, you can stand with me. So I told the guys to remove the, the podium from in front of us so the world could see us. And I stood to put my arm around him in front of, in front of the whole world. And I thought, Lord, what is that about? And I went through all kinds of scenarios. <laughs> and, then, and then I realized what it was about. It's another mandate to the church. He wants to restore to us the power of love to touch even our enemies and turn their hearts. And if we can't do that, then we're just posers. We're not Christians. Just posers. Another thread in my stream. So there's three mandates. I'll, fit, I'll, I'll come back to those before I'm done. hope you can take a lot today. <laughs> Look for an increase in these coming days in lighthouse churches and ministries to arise in the world. Now what I mean by that is there a lot of people are prophesying there's going to be this great sweeping revival that will restore America to its roots. I don't believe it. Because none of the conditions... We, we don't have any of the conditions in place for that to happen. Every revival that's ever come to this country involved um, the cross, the blood, and repentance from sin. That worked because even when, this, even when the nation had fallen into sin, they understood what they had departed from and knew what to repent to. What has happened in our generation is we have erased the consciousness of sin. There is no sin. Nobody's wrong. Everybody's a victim. So sexual immorality, that's not a sin. Nobody feels guilty about that. Homosexuality now is regarded as natural. Nobody feels guilty about that. You know, it, it's just, we don't have a plumb line to return to. In Colorado, we just legalized pot. You know, nobody regards that as a sin in this culture. 
so we don't have a plumb line to know what we've departed to that we could repent to. And I believe that the Baal spirit has taken such hold over the whole culture that now the course is set. If you understand what I'm saying, there's been a decision made in the heart of the culture that will not be unmade. That's the bad news. But that doesn't mean revival isn't coming. I believe we're going to see the greatest revival ever descending upon lighthouse churches and ministries. I call them islands of glory in a sea of mud that rise as lights in the darkness so that people can see where to come as a, as a multitude of people will figure out that sin doesn't work. Somebody help me, please. Lighthouse churches and ministries. And as these lighthouse churches and ministries arise, we are going to see gradually, we're going to see the demise of the seeker-sensitive model where you sing three nice little songs and have a nice fluffy sermon from the great, about the great Santa Claus in the sky and go home feeling good about yourself. That's not going to be enough in the days to come. Crisis is coming. It will deepen. And that secret sensitive model will not be enough to take care of people in this hour. And as that happens, there's going to be a redeployment of the saints into the places where the Spirit of God is allowed to manifest, where there's real substance. And there are four signs that are going to accompany those things. They're going to be presence-based. They're going to do what we've been doing tonight. They're going to... A lighthouse church presses into the presence of God until there's a breakthrough. You don't get three songs and be done and go home. You stay with the worship until you know you've broken through into the presence of the Lord and you know that He's there. And you're going to stay with it until it's done. And the Word of God preached will be the truth and it will be uncompromising. It'll not, you know, the Lord told me a while ago, He said, I don't want you to preach to people, I want you to preach from me. And there's a difference. Hmm. You know, I'm a pastor. I have a heart for what people need. But I love God more. And I don't want to preach to people. I want to preach from Him. And if that costs me, so be it. If that gets me crucified, so be it. Because I'm going to be accountable for eternity. Yes. Presence-based. Second, freedom for God to move. I can't tell you how many places I've been where leadership was really afraid of what God might do. We got to keep that controlled. We can't upset people, you know. Can't make them uncomfortable. In lighthouse churches, when God begins to move, leadership gets out of the way and says, God, have your way. Do what you want to do. If people are going to laugh, let them laugh. If they're going to fall, let them fall. If people are going to shake, let them shake. Because we're not afraid of that. People say, well, I could preach all night about it decency and order. I'll tell you what, one man's decency and order is another man's death. It all depends on your starting point and your perspective. You can have a lot of people laughing and falling and what appears to be chaos on the outside and underneath is this wonderful order to it all. If they're going to let God move, let God do what he wants to do, do not be afraid of the fallout. I mean, they, they at Pentecost, they called those disciples, they, they said, to them, yeah, they thought they were drunk, didn't they? These men are full of sweet wine. Well, what do people look like when they've been drinking? <laughs> hey, you know, come on. <laughs> Here's the third thing. Culture of honor. Church hasn't been good at that one. And that means I don't care who you are, I don't care where you look like, I don't care how you're dressed, I don't care how you smell, I don't, I don't care what you come from, I don't care what you've done. You're going to be treated with dignity and honor. We're going to see what God has placed in you. No matter how many layers we have to look through, we're going to call that out. You want to know what one of the primary functions of the prophetic is? It's to see past all that crap and see what's inside of somebody. It's the ability to look inside of Matthew, the turncoat traitor tax collector, and see an apostle and call him out. You know, that's the prophetic that's what the church, that's what a prophetic church does. It creates an atmosphere that's a culture of honor that invites people to come to holiness. Nobody ever got condemned into repentance. Amen. And here's the, the fourth one, a healing atmosphere. I mean an atmosphere of healing. It's been my dream forever that people be able to walk into our church and just by being in the atmosphere of anointing that they'd be healed. And some of the best healings that have happened in my church have happened by the sovereign touch of God while we worshipped. 
Nobody laying hands on them, getting credit for it. Nobody up front hyping it and making it move. It's just the presence of God in a healing atmosphere. You know, and so in my church, you know, we train our ministry teams for praying for healing. We, we have a counseling department full of trained lay counselors. And, you know, because we're going we're gonna to provide opportunities for healing and for restoration. And we're going to create an atmosphere in which it can happen. So those are the four signs. <clears throat> now, toward all of this, I believe that we are living literally in Revelation 8, 1 through 5, I believe that we are in that period of time. It's another one I could teach on all night. I'm going to try and compress it. The book of Revelation is one of the most misunderstood books of the Bible. We make it a lot more complicated than we should. People will say, where do you think we are? Are we in the seals? Are we in the trumpets? Are we in the you know, bowls? I'm going to make it really simple for you. Each one of those things, the seals, the trumpets, seven significant signs, seven bowls of the wrath of God, each one of them is a different look at the same sequence of events. It's not one coming after the other. Each one of those is a different look at this. I call it the diamond view. It's like looking at the, at the light through a different refraction. So each one has a different perspective. And so the seven seals, you get accelerating trouble, coming toward the end until Jesus returns from the perspective of the opening of the Word of God, as the seven seals are broken on the scroll so that it can be opened. And then you rewind back to the beginning of the movie, and from a different perspective, somebody looking at it from a different angle, now you get the seven trumpets. Well, the seven trumpets are the same sequence of events, a little deeper view this time, from the perspective of the announcement of the coming of the king. The shofar blows. And the king comes with the same sequence, acceleration of trouble leading to the end when Jesus returns. Seven significant signs in the heavens. Same thing. Rewind to the beginning and now tell the same story from the perspective of cosmic disaster or cosmic warfare. Rewind. Start again with the bowls of the wrath of God. Now you get the deepest look of all, but it's the same sequence of events, utter destruction, <laughs> accelerating trouble, leading to the return of Jesus. So, what's happened in Revelation 8 is you've gone through the seals, now you've rewound to the beginning of the movie, and there's silence in heaven. Something's about to start. So it's the beginning again. Something's about to start. Somebody said, heaven is a noisy place because there's orders going forth from heaven. You know, and angels coming and going. When heaven gets silent, look out. God's about to do something. So you get silence in heaven. And what's happening in this silence in heaven is they're waiting for the prayers of the saints to rise. And so the prayers of the saints rise to heaven, and the angel at the altar of incense, right before the Holy of Holies, I wrote about this in one of the books too. I don't have time to get it all here tonight. But the incense from the, from the altar of incense, which symbolizes prayer, is rising to the Father, and the angel adds that incense to the prayers of the saints. Those prayers are therefore magnified in heaven, and the angel responds by casting fire into the earth. I'm telling you, we're living in that period of time right now. There have been calls for prayer going forth in the land. And the reason for that is that we are in that season. It's a time for the deepest, craziest intercession we've ever engaged in. It's a time to devote ourselves to prayer because God will respond by casting kingdom fire into the earth. By sending that anointing we've been hungry for. It's a strategic time. We need this anointing now. We are called to manifest the kingdom of God on earth in a way that we never have before, even under fire. And we, you know, Jeremiah talks about travailing in prayer. He talks about groaning in prayer. That's the same message. And I'm telling you literally, where are we in the end time events? Rewind to the beginning. We're at the beginning of the end time events when the prayers of the saints are rising to heaven and the angel will respond by casting fire into the earth. Are you hearing me? That's a prophetic word. <laughs> That's where we are. Now all of that brings me to this, and this is where I shift into pastor. How much can you handle tonight? Thank you. Because <laughs> I'm only two pages into 15 pages of notes. <laughs> That's a warning. <laughs> I've been thinking lately about how Christians, 
Even spirit-filled Christians will nod their heads up and down when somebody like me talks about the Father's heart and the love of God and God's grace and all that kind of stuff. You know, we'll, 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 and, and we'll talk about how we're called to walk in it. And all the saints go, Amen, Pastor, that's a great message. And everybody smiles when I talk about, about receiving the messiest people into our midst. When I talk about receiving you know, the worst of sinners into our midst and giving them honor and giving them grace, everybody nods their heads up and down. The darkest people, yes, Pastor, yes, that's what we're about. That's who we are. I told my people, I said, that's who we are as a church. It's in our DNA. This is what we've done. You know, we've taken in some of the worst of kids. I mean, some of the worst of kids. And they are now some of our top leaders. We'll do this. Everybody goes, yes, Pastor, that's great. Nobody wants to quarrel, you know, when you talk about the Father's heart. But when it comes to people in situations out there, outside the body of Christ, where we don't see them every day, when we're not involved with them every day, that it doesn't seem so personal to us. Where they're, they're not on our doorstep, they're not on our faces. They're sort of this amorphous mass of, of nameless faces that, and when that happens, something else comes to the surface. That's when our words and our actions begin to contradict what our minds and our mouths said that we agree with. I told my own people, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I read your Facebook posts. I know what you say. Agree with me on Sunday, and then I read you. I know where we are. Something other than love begins to flow out of our mouths. Something other than love begins to flow out of our hearts and it begins to multiply and grow. And it feels so appealing. It feels so justified. It feels so right. But as a pastor, I told my people, I said, I begin to, I begin to grieve and wonder if anything I ever said has taken root in anybody. Connect the dots. Do we really get it? Do we really understand? And why, you know, why, why do we miss that like that? Why, why do we so easily speak and act contrary to what we say we believe? Well, the root of it is fear. And right now, over this whole nation, we're wrapped in a blanket of fear. I mean, if you felt that, really, I mean, come on. It's just a blanket of fear that's pervaded this whole nation, and it's, and it's found its way into the church. 1 John 4, 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now, most of us would think that hate cancels love. The hate is somehow the opposite of love, that it cancels love. That's not really true. That's not true any more than dark can overcome light. The smallest match will light up the darkest room. Darkness cannot overcome light. Hate can never cancel real love, ever. By its nature, listen to me, I'm talking faith tonight. You want to talk real faith, I'm talking real faith. By its nature, love prevails because light overcomes darkness. You've got to believe this. That's why Jesus could suffer at the cross and he could say at the last, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. The darkness is coming at him and it could not overcome the light. <coughs> Real love can't be overcome. It can't be erased. It can't be defeated. Real love always overcomes the darkness. Always. Love wins. Real love prevails. So as opposed to hate, what cancels and destroys love is fear. In the same way that perfect love casts out fear, fear casts out love. I see it again and again. Fear destroys love because there's no fear in love. Once we begin to listen to any form of fear... Once we begin to give any form of fear a place in the heart, love begins to die. Once fear enters the picture, it pushes love aside, and then hate in all its various forms begins to take its place. You may not agree with me. I hope you do. I might offend some people. 
I probably if I don't, I haven't done my job. But I think the church doesn't understand love. And I think that we do a lot of hating that we think is righteous. And I'm kind of a radical. I think if it's not love, it's hate. I don't think there's any in between. Sometimes we prophetic people are accused of being extreme. Yes, we are. It's black or it's white. I'm not interested in gray. You don't usually recognize what I'm talking about is hate because it masquerades as all kinds of other things that seem right and good to us. The enemy comes disguised as an angel of light. But hate is what it is because it isn't love. It can be, I'm going to talk pastorally for a minute, it can be as simple as fear of not being loved. Like there won't be, a love, there won't be enough love for me. My spouse won't love me. My children won't love me. There's never enough for me. Well, love is a word that speaks of the sacrifices you make for the sake of others when you lay aside your own needs. Or as love covers a multitude of sins and offenses, it's not about whether you are loved, it's about whether you can love. That's love. But when you fear not being loved, then what you start doing is you start doing things to, to, to make others love you. And then it goes all wrong. Because now it's not about them, it's about you. Mm. They don't deliver now because, because they can't. And then you're angry and you're hurt. And then you do more of the things to get your needs met and to get that love. That will, and that will eventually turn the love away. I see it over and over again. And the ultimate end of all that process is the death that we call hate. This is how marriages die. This is how we lose our children. Ourselves to become afraid in relation to them, afraid of what they do, or of what they're going to do, or afraid that they'll fail, or, or afraid of, of what they feel toward us, or how they treat us, or how they violate our rules. Then it's no longer about them, it's about us. And love gets pushed aside in favor of something else. And families break up. We begin to do things in anger then, I see parents do this every day. We begin to do things in anger to try to force our kids to conform their behavior to something we're more comfortable with, particularly with teenagers. But that only drives them further away because now it's no longer about them, it's about our need. It's no longer about our sacrifice for them, it's about what they, we want them to do to make us feel better. And so love gets lost. Connection is broken. But it started with fear, and it ended with that form of hatred we euphemistically call alienation. Perfect love casts out fear. But fear, when it's allowed to overcome faith, when it's allowed to overcome trust in God, casts out love. And what I want to say to Christians, this is so important in this day, do we really, I'm going to ask you this several times, do we really have so little faith in the power of what we've given our children in the Lord? Do we really have so little faith in the power of the gospel that we've chosen to live by? Really? Now, I'm not talking about our perfect love. Because we're not capable of perfect love. Jesus is capable of perfect love. God is love. His is the perfect. Ours is the flawed. What drives out fear and prevents and overcomes hate is a perfected perception of His perfect love. To rest in it, trust it, know it, to rely on it in any and all circumstances in the face of all threats. And when that perception, perception of His perfection is in place, it displaces fear and it heads off hatred before it can get started. And I'll tell you what, oppression and depression will go with it. One of the things I teach from time to time is self-focus is a straight line to depression. Most people would cease to be depressed if they get over themselves. When we know and we trust the perfection of His love, then we don't do the self-oriented things that flow from the root of fear. 
and that and, and, and those things that end up destroying love, producing alienation or offense in families and churches and nations and between races. And this is where I begin to mess with some other things because I have a confrontation to make of the body of Christ. Right now, fear is canceling love and it's obscuring our witness in the world by causing us to dehumanize entire people groups and descend into what is really hatred. The only thing that has the power to keep us from dehumanizing, de I can't talk to me, from dehumanizing other races or people groups is a perception of the perfected love of God that cancels fear by rooting us in who he is and by teaching us to rest in him. We need a revelation at a heart level of who he really is. And we really don't have it or we wouldn't say what we say and do what we do. At that point, at the point of perfected perception of God's love, I don't need anything else to make me feel important. I don't need anything else to make me feel superior to somebody else. I don't need anything else to make me feel significant or chosen. Every day, I hear streams of hatred coming from the mouths of Christians toward Muslims. Before I bother you with that, either Jeremiah turned up the heat or the Holy Spirit came on me, so maybe both. Maybe both. Hatred. Look out for those Muslims, they want to take over. Look out for those Muslims, they want to bring Sharia law. Look out for those Muslims, they want to kill us. They want to they, they want to pervert our country. Look out, it's a religion of hate. I don't disagree with any of that. It's all true. One level or, or, or another. But I'd also say that it's all fear. And it's the fear that cancels love. And it leads us to dehumanize an entire group of people we don't even know. That we've been called to reach. Do we really have so little faith in the power of the gospel. Listen to me. We're going to need that faith in the days to come. Do we really have so little faith in the power of the love of the Father poured into us through Jesus? What are we afraid of? Islam has no concept of the Father's love. But I'll tell you what, it's built into every human being to be hungry for it. And we have it to give. All that hate, all that fear will never open the door to win these people to Jesus. And trust me, I'm telling you, they're not being sent here by the devil. There are a lot of Christians saying that. The devil's sending them here to take over. I have people saying, Islam is the Antichrist. Nonsense! You know who's sending them here? God! You know why? Because we can't get into their closed countries. And so God sent them here to meet us. Hello? Come on. It's a good word right there. Yeah. Wake up! Wake up. The enemy wants us to be afraid. Because if we're afraid, then we'll hate them. And they won't be human beings to us and we won't reach them. I go through airports now and I see women, you know, they'll have the, the, the airline you know, uniform on, but then there's the shuttle over the head. Maybe I need to be asking God, not why are they here? And I don't want them here. Maybe I need to be asking God, Lord, is there a prophetic word? Amen. Is there some act of love I can show this individual? Something, please? Really? 200 years ago, we let fear and judgment blind us to what God had sown into Native American culture as bridge points for communicating the gospel. I can speak to this authoritatively because in spite of the fact that I have my mother's face, I'm a member of the Osage Nation. I'm a Native American. And I know, I know what happened. God built bridge concepts into Native American culture and the white man came and 
missed it. They were afraid in various ways of Native American people and called it all demonic, called everything in Native culture demonic. And now Native American people are the most unreached people group in North America, even today. Are we going to do it again? Hmm. Hear me. Hmm. God's sending these people to our doorstep. <clears throat> we can't afford to miss this. Mess with you a little deeper. How about all this Christian hatred directed at the gay community? They have an agenda, you know. Come on. Do we really not believe that light exposes darkness? Seriously. You know what I mean by that? The enemy wants people to believe that darkness is light. Do we really not believe that when the glory of a Christian marriage shines on someone else's life, that their darkness is, is exposed by it? Do we really not know who Jesus is? We've tested this again and again. We have kids coming into our youth group out of the, the culture, you know. We have a lot of gay kids coming in. Some of the best growth in our youth groups come from gay kids. And you know what? We never confront their homosexuality. Never. Because it's not our job to convict. You heard me say that. <coughs> Whose job is it? Holy, Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's my job to love. Do we really believe <coughs> that the Lord's light and love will expose darkness to be darkness? Mm -hmm. And when darkness is exposed to be darkness, people say, deliver me. Deliver me. Some of those little gay 15-year-old girls coming into our youth group will come to my son now and they'll say, you know what? I'm not gay. Love did that. We never had to say a word. Love did that. People, we're going to have to believe this in the days to come. We're going to have to believe the gospel we've been given. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Awaken, sleeper. Come out of it. See, that light that shines through us and from us, that's, that's the love that casts out fear. It's going to enable us to rise to the best days of our lives, to shine in the end times and walk in the greatest outpouring of the Spirit since Pentecost. It's there for the receiving. But we're going to have to let his perfect love cast out fear. We're going to have to believe it. Yes. Believe it. Yes. You want to hear faith teaching? Believe it. Yes. It's not the manipulative kind that seeks to make something happen. It's just believing the love which God has for us. Mm. And us means them too. Jesus overcame all that fear. He overcame all that hate when love came to cast out fear. Jesus, Jews, Jews hated Samaritans, you know. They hated Samaritans so much, were so afraid of being defiled by Samaritans that they would take the long way around Samaria so as not to walk through Samaria and be defiled by those awful people. What did Jesus do? He went into Samaria and talked to a woman who had five husbands and every man in town knew who she was. A woman no one else would speak with. Mm. She was such an outcast that she came to get water in the middle of the day. Respectable women came early in the morning when it was cool. She came in the middle of the day because she couldn't hang out with polite company. And when she went back to tell them she found the Messiah, who would she talk to? The men, because the women wouldn't talk with her. Mm. So Jesus goes to the worst of Samaria. He's not afraid of being defiled. He's not afraid of Samaritans. Jews hated Gentiles. And they would have good reason. Because the Romans were oppressing them and exploiting their nation. They didn't want to hang out with Gentiles. They, some, there were some Pharisees that would cross to the other side of the street to keep a Gentile shadow from falling on them. And yet Jesus goes to the Gentiles. 
the Apostle Paul, the greatest Gentile hater of all, gets sent to the Gentiles. And it's his whole gospel. Rome whipped, beat, imprisoned, and killed the early Christians. But if you examine church history, you don't hear, you don't hear a whisper, you don't hear a whisper of hatred fed by fear coming from any believer in the book of Acts toward Rome. You study the first several hundred years of church history and you don't hear a whisper of, of, of hatred fed by fear from the early church fathers, even though they were whipped and beaten and imprisoned and burned at the stake. And in fact, one of the stories I love is Polycarp. He was one of the early saints. The Romans were, they, they were burning him at the stake. And they said this, the witnesses said this sweet aroma kept coming off of the fire. And he wasn't getting burned up. And he's preaching from the flames, the love of Jesus. And so finally one of the Roman soldiers had had enough and went and stabbed him through the heart. It was the only way they could kill him. Yeah. We want to whine and cry because some of our freedoms are evaporating in this country and we return hatred for it. It's time for us to have some real faith. Light exposes darkness. And when people, when people saw that the pagan practices in Rome were, were that they thought were light and good, weren't light and good, when they saw it because of the light of the Gospels flowing, flowing through the Christians, they repented of the Roman, the Roman Empire became Christian. They didn't rail in those days against the Roman government. You won't find that except in the book of Acts, but that's, I mean, I'm sorry, in the book of Revelation, but that's the end times. That's, that's the final chapter. They didn't rail against that awful Roman government. They, they didn't cry out against Rome's immorality until the very end of the book of Revelation. They just loved people. There were two plagues that came to Rome where thousands and thousands of people died in that first couple hundred years. And the Christians were the only ones who would take care of the plague victims. Families would throw their, their, their somebody gets sick in the household, they'd throw them out in the street because they didn't want to get sick. And the Christians come along, take them home, take care of them. Unafraid. And they won the Roman Empire with it. Light overcomes darkness. Right now, right now the gospel is the power of salvation. Still the power of salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. The insider and the outsider. The cleansed and the defiled. The whole and the broken. The homosexual, the prostitute, the drug dealer, the pot smoker, the addict, the child molester. The dishonest businessman, the wife beater, and the adulterer. I just make the list. Still the power of salvation. Do we really have so little faith in the gospel that we have to be afraid? When we allow that fear to take root in us, we give permission for hate to take root. You know, there was a... Sometimes I have to give illustrations to just pop into my head whether they fit or not, but it's because it's the Lord. When I, in my early years as a, as, a, as a pastor, I was counseling full time for Elijah House, helping pioneer inner healing. And I would have a couple come in, and I'd find out that the man had been abusing his wife. And what rose up in me was, "You sphincter muscle! I'm going to take you in the backyard and rearrange your face." It was, it was a, you know. You don't strike a woman, you animal. You know, that's what came up in my heart. And then the Lord convicted me. And he said, if you're going to have that attitude toward him, you can't help him. And I had to learn to have compassion and love for the abuser. And you know what? That's simply faith in the gospel, isn't it? Yes. Do we really, really believe the power of the light we've been given? Really? I'm trying to challenge you tonight in every way I know how. When you let fear into your heart, rather than the, the, the trust in the perfected love of God, then hatred in all its forms will take root. If you allow hatred in your heart in one place, listen to me, this is important. We can't compromise this. If you let hatred into your heart in one place, then pretty soon it will bleed over into negativity about other races and other people groups and you begin, to, you, you begin to feed into the divisions that are destroying this nation rather than 
than, than rise to our calling as reconcilers. I'm going to talk in a minute. It's going to bleed into your family. Again, Ephesians 6.12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. That's a well-organized army with a carefully laid plan. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our struggle is against powers and principalities, not people groups. If we're going to fulfill our destiny in this day and in this coming year, we've got to get that straight. There has to be a revival rooted in this. We need an agape revival. Do we really not believe, I keep saying this, do we, not, do we really not believe that exposure to the light reveals evil? And that when evil is revealed, people choose the light. I'm not talking about whether or not I need to qualify this. Because sometimes people get mad at me when I preach this message. I'm not talking about whether or not we should resist ISIS. I'm not talking about whether or not we should seal our borders. I'm not talking about whether or not we should deploy military forces to, de to, to, to destroy evil organizations and empires. So if you were headed there, don't go there. That's not what I'm talking about. We will do what we have to do to protect the innocent. We will do what we have to do to preserve a nation. We will. There's nothing wrong with that. In the 1940s, America did what had to be done to destroy the evil that was Nazism and Japanese militarism. But you know what we did after that? We're the first nation in history ever, ever, to turn around and rebuild its enemies and make them into our fastest friends. And we prospered because of that. And we became the most powerful nation on earth because of it. We didn't surrender as a nation to ongoing fear and hatred in the name of what we thought would be justice. Soviet Union took a different path. They didn't do what we chose to do. They chose oppression instead. And now that empire is broken and America stands alone as the world's only superpower. Well, love did that. Whether you recognize it or not, love did that. What did that was trust in the goodness of God at a time when we were still a God-fearing nation. And we're still reaping the benefit of it. Fear casts out love, leads to all forms of hatred. Fear destroys relationships. Fear, just, fear alienates husbands and wives. It drives children away. It can be the fear of, of not having, and so we sacrifice everything that's precious. We sacrifice everything truly important that would be love to pursue prosperity. That's part of what it means to have a poverty spirit. It can be fear of not being loved, and so we manipulate and hurl angry words in order to get it. And isn't that the, 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 the root of the definition of insecurity? All that stuff we do out of fear of not being loved fails. Because those are forms of lovelessness, and I call it hate, and fear stands at the root of it. Perfect love cancels all that. It leads to victory, restoration, and healing. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? We need a serious revelation of who Jesus is. People call me prophetic these days, and I guess I own that. People like Jeremiah, you know, we'll give you prophetic words and stuff. But you know what? We don't need prophetic words. We need a revelation of who Jesus is. And if anybody's prophesying to you and it doesn't give you some kind of a revelation of who Jesus is in your life, don't listen. We need to focus on who Jesus is and be consumed by what we see in his face. 2 Corinthians 3.18 We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Just as from the Lord the Spirit. When I see him for who he is, I am changed. I can't help but be changed. Because his love touches my insecurities and fears and swallows them up in his glory by the revelation of who he is. When I begin to feed on things in my heart that look like hurt or look like fear or broken relationship or offense taken or an attitude toward a race of people or a people group, I need to ask myself, is this the face of Jesus I see? Is this the face I want the world to see? Is this the face I want the world to judge Jesus by? Does what I feel politically or racially 
or religiously really reflect the revealed glory of Jesus? What do I feel toward Muslims? What do I feel toward white supremacists? What do I feel toward black people? If I'm black, what do I feel about whites? Or what do I feel toward pimps and whores? What do I feel toward homosexuals? What do I feel toward drug dealers? Thieves, child molesters. What do I feel? How much of what I feel is born of fear? Fear that there's some kind of threat. That they're going to take something away from me. And how much of that is really the heart of God? How much of me has, how much of me has come to resemble the nature of my Lord? My destiny is not to be blessed. My destiny is to be conformed to the image of the Son. That, that, that's, can't that be our consuming desire? Everything else follows after that. How much do I really trust his love? Do I trust his love to convict my enemies? Or do I think I have to hate and judge and be angry in order to win? Isn't that a lie we accept? I've got to be angry in order to win. No, I don't. Do I trust that real light exhibited in grace and love will change those who might be my enemies? Or do I really believe I have to hate them in order to overcome them? I'm not sure that most Christians understand how deep that goes in our hearts. Am I so afraid that I render myself unable to stop all that ugliness and just trust God? But we're going to feel self-righteous in all the negative words. We're going to feel self-righteous in the condemnations and hatreds. Because after all, those people are just wrong, aren't they? Yeah, and a lot of people on that sinner's list, they're wrong. They are. Muslims have it wrong, that's true. Mormons have it wrong, that's true. Buddhists have it wrong, okay, the list goes on. But there's an enormous difference between feeling self-righteous and walking in love and compassion. Fear cancels love, leads to hate. Perfect. Why are people of other faiths coming to America or Europe? Why that Muslim invasion? The enemy of our soul thinks he's sinning. Just like he thought he was stamping out what God's plan was by crucifying Jesus. It's what's called a Pyrrhic victory. When the enemy thinks he's won, but in his victory he's lost. He's sending them here so they're going to encounter us and experience the true love of the Father. That won't happen if we let fear drive out love. Book of Acts. You still there? You taking this in? This burns in my spirit, people. It's not the kind of thing that gets pastors or prophet, prophetic people like me in front of audiences of thousands. <laughs> I keep thinking I want to sell some books. If I'm going to do that, I need to set a date for the return of Jesus. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Then I get tired, crazy things run through my head. You all realize that Jeremiah and I weren't too popular, right? Because we tried to tell people that the Shemitahs and the blood moons would amount to very little. People didn't like us very much for that. So, anyway. In the book of Acts, Peter, the great apostle, the first of the apostles to be sent to preach to Gentiles, to cross the racial barrier, first of those, to talk to people that the Jews thought were unclean and wouldn't associate with, he came to Antioch. And there, out of fear of condemnation and defilement, he refused to eat with the Gentiles. And this is what scripture says, Acts chapter 2, verse 11. When Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, listen to the word, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Fear drove out love and resulted in a form of hatred so that a whole church was defiled by it because somebody who should have known better fell into fear and lost his love. That's what's been happening to the whole body of Christ in this country. And Paul had to openly rebuke Peter in the presence of everybody. 
once we stop trusting God, once we allow ourselves to get out of touch with the power of his love and begin to give place to fear, hatred will take its place every time. Satan loves a vacuum. You give him a vacuum, he's happy to fill it. You might think, and I'm almost at the end, you might think that you can spew negativity at a people group and feel justified in doing it, but once hatred, listen, once hatred is allowed to take root in just one place, it will spread to every area of life because it's a cancer that metastasizes. In the natural, your cancer might begin in your lungs, but if it isn't removed, it will spread to every other organ in the body and it will kill you. I guarantee if you let hatred take root in one area, no matter how removed from your personal life it might seem, you will see it take root in your family, you'll see it take root in your marriage, and you'll see it take root in your church. You'll see it manifest in broken relationships in the church. You'll see a gradual erosion of real love between the members, and it won't be limited to that just with just that one area of life. It's an infection, it spreads. Racial judgments begin in fear. They begin in fear of oppression or fear of insignificance. So I've got to puff myself up at the expense of that other people group that I feel isn't as right on as I am. And those judgments become hatred and you think that it only affects that one area of life. You think you can carry that defilement in just that one part of your life, but it's a disease and it metastasizes and it bleeds over into relationships with your family and friends because part of you is dying. I wonder if full revival hasn't come to, to, to lighthouse churches in America because we haven't faced this issue of the hatred we carry in our hearts and the fear that we walk in. Why would God pour out an anointing for a great ingathering of souls on a people who don't want to go talk to the souls he wants to go and save? Hello. This isn't a big happy fizzy party here. <laughs> that fear leading to loss of love leading, leading to hate that can be aimed at Muslims it can be aimed at Democrats you know those godless progressives and liberals or those damnable right wing Republicans depending on political stance makes no difference who the target is or how justified the hatred seems once it spreads and destroys it's going to affect your sense of the nearness of God and every other relationship you're part of you can shrink the tumor. But if the cells have metastasized, once you begin to dehumanize any group of people in the name of some principle or in the name of some theology or philosophy, we've looked away from the face of Jesus. And we begin to be changed by the cancer rather than from glory to glory. First John starts... Chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can't mix light with darkness. You can't hate Muslims or homosexuals or drug dealers or Washington politicians or any other group and expect your family relationships not to be affected. I see it every day. You show me somebody spewing hatred politically or spewing hatred at another people group or judgment toward any people group or race of people and I will show you a family stressed at home every time without exception. If you fear a place, it will cancel love. Hatred will fill the vacuum. It can be difficult to sort out sometimes because hatred will always justify itself. It will often manifest itself as righteousness. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. But we're a people of light. We're a culture of light. Let light drive out darkness. Colossians 4, 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most... Catch that? Toward outsiders. Making the most of the opportunity. That's that Muslim you meet on the street. Or who serves you in a retail store. Or that homosexual that you meet someplace who will tell you that you're an awful person because you're a Christian. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Decide.
how you will position yourself and your church. Let me finish with this. This is about the coming year. I prophesied at the beginning of 2015. This is almost a shift of emphasis, sort of. I prophesied at the beginning of, of the year that we would see an acceleration of smaller terrorist attacks that could not be stopped because they can't be detected. There are too many of them, too insignificant. They won't be seen. And we've seen that. We've seen that begin to accelerate. We're going to see more of it. ISIS, I believe, if I'm hearing from the Lord correctly, ISIS will be gradually contained geographically, but that's like shrinking a tumor when, when, when the cancer cells have already spread to infect other parts of the body. So they may be contained geographically over the course of the next year, but they've already spread cells throughout the Western world. And we will see more of these problems. How are we going to carry ourselves? How are we going to respond? Look for an increase, I believe, look for an increase in turmoil and uncertainty in September, October. That goes beyond the election. I don't know exactly what form it will take. I just see like a bubbling cauldron going on in September and October that's more than the coming of the election. And I believe um, that in relation to that, we need to determine right now, Jeremiah said it, what will be the source of our stability? Will it be the revelation of who Jesus really is? Or will we try to put our faith in some kind of a political or military solution that won't work? We need to carry out those three mandates I talked about at the beginning. Cleansing the prophetic, healing the wounds of the church, restoring the father heart to leadership. And three, overpowering love even for those with whom we strenuously disagree. I talked for a long time today. And I only know one way to respond to a message like this. We started with a time of repentance. And you called it. You didn't really know where I was going, but you called it. And I'm not sure exactly how to structure it tonight. But I think we need to come before the Lord with two things on our hearts. The first is repentance for any place that fear has taken root, whether it's family or culture or between races. And just say, Lord, I'm sorry I want this out of me. I want pure love flowing out of me. And then, Lord, give me that revelation, a real revelation of who you are that rewrites my DNA, that changes me. I need to know you more deeply than I ever have. And so, Father, I want to pray right now that that come down on us. Lord, as we sit here tonight, that our hearts are changed. <coughs> I kind of felt like tonight should be a commitment. Not necessarily even a time we come up to get ministered to once again. But maybe a time when we say, Lord, I will stand. I will stand. I will walk in this. I'm making a commitment to you, God, tonight that I will stand. I will stand for the revelation of who you are. I will stand for the love of the Father. I will not walk in the hatred of this culture around me. I will shine as a light. But maybe the way to do that is just if you're making that commitment, stand right where you are. And I don't care if you stand on your chair. <laughs> you know, there needs to be some passion. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to do. I, mean, I want to stand as tall as I can for this. I want to finish my life like a Joshua and a, and a Caleb. I'm 64. I figure I got 20 years before I'm as old as Joshua and as Caleb. And he was as strong at 84 as he was when he started. I want to say something to some of you that are old and tired. That I, I believe it pays into this. It plays, it plays into this. It plays into this. Tired is a choice. Discouragement is a choice. We need to drop the idolatry of emotions in this culture. Quit waiting for somebody to make us feel something. 
There's such a, there's a thing we call chosen passion. And I know that, you know, I'm old enough to know that every bone in my body wants to lie down and go to sleep. I know what it is to get up in the morning and every bone in my body hurts. I know what it is to want to lie down and take a nap and probably not wake up. I know what that's like. But I'm choosing life every day. I'm choosing passion, chosen passion every day. Because the alternative is death. And I will fight for the love of my father until, the, until my dying breath. And I will not let it go. So Lord, I release upon this company here the power to stand. The power to stand for your grace. The power to believe. Lord, I, I bless this company here with faith, real trust in you. Lord, I ask that you rewrite our definitions of what faith and trust are. That we would trust you enough to walk in that love, to know, to know, to know that the anger of a man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Lord, that your love is the power to change the world. Lord, that we would go out of here as a militant people in love who will say, I'm going to love you and there's nothing you can do about it. God. I bless this company to go forth from here and love the unlovable. I call forth prophetic words for Muslim people we meet in the street. Lord, I bless some of these people here to, to make friendships, friendships with Islamic people. I bless the races in this place to come together. That there would no longer be divisions between black and white, Native American and Asian, or whatever it is. That your love would overcome. That your light would wash away darkness. Lord, we, as a body of Christ, we're not going to stand for this. We don't have to stand for this. We walk in the light. We walk in righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Jeremiah. Just, just one more prayer. Will you just keep your hand on your heart? I just... But the Lord just wanted to encourage us not to prophesy from the place of judgment. But prophesy from the Father's heart. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you would surround us with people that we have a problem with. And call us to prophesy your heart to them. I can just personally testify that there have been many seasons where the Lord wanted to upgrade the anointing to prophesy on my life. And in every season, He has called me to prophesy to my enemies. When my flesh wanted them to suffer, God called me to prophesy prosperity over them. And so, Father, I pray that You would deal with any judgment that we have in our heart. Just like the Lord is saying right now, there, there are many people in this room that you have suffered a rift in a relationship this year. This year, that there's been a break in a relationship. I see some of you having had relationship or friendship with certain people for many years. And the Lord would say to you tonight, this is the night to rise up. And rather than curse, I want you to bless. Rather than hold resentment and bitterness, I've called you to forgive. And I pray that a prophetic spirit would rise up on every person in this room. Lord, that we would prophesy to those that we've lost relationship with. And let your word bring healing, not only to their heart, but to ours. Lord, let your word bring life, not only to their heart, but to ours. Lord, let your word bring redemption, not only to their heart, but to ours. Lord, I'm asking that you would divinely position us tonight next to those, Lord, that our heart has a judgment toward. And let us release your love and your passion like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.